In this video, I want to explain what is meant by a non-centered parameterization of a hierarchical model, and I want to talk about the circumstances when these types of parameterization are useful. So firstly, it's worth bearing in mind that what I'm talking about now is only really relevant to hierarchical models. So in this video, I'm going to start off by discussing what is meant by a centered parameterization. I'm then going to talk about why this can be problematic. And finally, I'm going to talk about the solution to this problem. And the solution to this problem is to use non-centered parameterizations. And I'm going to explain in this video how this actually helps with the problem. Firstly, I'm going to introduce our model. And what we're going to assume is that we have a data generating process that looks something like this. We imagine that we have some data x, which we're modeling as being normally distributed about some mean, which I'm just going to call here mu1, and some standard deviation, which I'm going to call sigma1. We then model the group mean for that process, mu1, as being drawn from some top-level distribution, which is also a normal with a mean mu t and some standard deviation, sigma t. So we can see that this is a hierarchical model. And whilst I haven't written it down, we're also going to assume that there is other data which is being drawn from other individual means which correspond to that particular group. So overall, we can see that this is a hierarchical model because we've got layers to our priors. Essentially, we have a top-level distribution, which is a normal with a mean mu t and a, ver a standard deviation, rather, sigma t. And this top-level distribution is then what is used to draw the individual values of mu, the means in the individual groups. So we imagine that we're drawing mu1 from this top level distribution, mu2 from this dis same distribution, and also mu k for the kth group. We imagine we have a number of these groups. And we imagine that the data from each of these individual groups is modeled as also being a normal distribution, except with the mean of that respective group. So we have a normal with a mean of mu1 and some standard deviation sigma1 in the first group and the same in the second group except with mu2 and sigma2, etc. And we imagine that the individual data is being drawn from these distributions as well. So in the first group, we have data x1 for the first individual, x2 for the second, all the way up to xp. In the second group, we have being drawn from the different distribution, x1 primed, say x2 primed, and all the way up to xp primed. And actually, I could rather write this as xq because we don't have to have the same number of individuals in the individual groups. And the same is true for the other groups in our sample. So we see that this is a hierarchical model in nature. We have some top level parameter mu t, which in some way determines what a level below parameter, mu1, is, which in turn determines what our data looks like. And the way that I've described this model thus far, if I were to code it up like this, would be what is known as a centered parameterization. It's centered because the group level means are centered on the top level parameters, mu t here. In other words, the mean of the bottom level parameters should be somewhere near mu t. So this is our centered parameterization of our statistical model. And it's the most intuitive way that you would actually code up this model, because it exactly corresponds to the way that you would write down the statistical model. Now that I've described what is meant by a centered parameterization, I want to focus on the problem with these parameterizations. Firstly, I want to talk about a circumstance when this isn't a problem, coding up a model like this. And this is the circumstance where we have lots of data, x. And we're imagining here, the way I'm going to sort of draw this diagram below, is that we have a lot of heterogeneity between our groups. And so in these graphs here, what I'm going to draw is a graph of the posterior distribution of mu t versus that of mu1. I'm also going to draw the y equals x line on here, which looks something like this dotted line I've drawn. If we have lots of data within each of our groups, and we have lots of groups, then we can imagine circumstances where the mean of the individual group parameter is quite different from the top level parameter. 
So we can imagine circumstances where the posterior contours look something like these mauve lines which I'm drawing now. And we can see that because the centre of our posterior contours do not lie on this line here and because there is no correlation we can see in this posterior contour, it is absolutely fine to sample from this model using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. So this is the circumstance where we've got lots of data and there is a lot of heterogeneity between those groups. A lot of heterogeneity between the groups essentially means that sigma t, our top level uh, spread of our individual group means, is going to be large. So this top circumstance here corresponds to sigma t being large. And as I've said, it is perfectly fine to use Hamiltonian Monte Carlo to sample from this distribution. And that's mainly because we don't have any sharp curvature in our posterior distribution, as I've drawn it here. Let's now consider an alternative circumstance, which is one that is frequently the case when using hierarchical models, which is that we've got relatively few data for each of the individual groups. Again, I'm going to draw on here our y equals x line here, and again, I'm going to draw mu t versus mu1. Uh, in particular, I'm going to draw the posterior contours in this circumstance. So in this circumstance where I've got relatively few data for each of the individual groups, then essentially it becomes very difficult to determine any differences between the group level means. So essentially the group level means end up looking exactly the same as the top level means. So this is the circumstance where sigma t is small. Essentially we cannot disentangle the group level means from the top level means. So what does this mean for our posterior contours? Well, they're going to be very sharply correlated with one another about the y equals x line. And so the posterior contours may look something like that which I'm drawing now. And we can see that there is a area of very sharp curvature which corresponds to the kind of centre of this distribution, sort of somewhere like this part of the posterior contour. I'm going to remove this arrow just so I can draw on it now. In this region, we can see that there are very sharp contours moving a, a perpendicular direction to the y equals x line. Essentially, moving in this direction, there is a very sharp uh, posterior contour. In other words, we've got a very sort of steep ridge here running along the y equals x line. So why is this type of posterior geometry problematic for Hamiltonian Monte Carlo? Well, the issue is Hamiltonian Monte Carlo seeks to set an optimal global step size. And what that means is that the distance that we step is independent of where we are in parameter space. This is a problem because essentially the way that I've drawn this posterior geometry, we want to step very different distances when we're approximating Hamiltonian dynamics dependent on where we are in parameter space. If we're in the tails, somewhere like here, then we want to step quite a long way in parameter space. And that's the case whether we're in the upper or the lower tails. We want to step sort of a, a long distance because posterior curvature here is relatively low. And hence, we can get away with stepping quite a long distance. Whereas when we're in the middle, if we were to use the same global step size as we did in the tails, then essentially our approximation to the Hamiltonian dynamics would be terrible and we would get divergent iterations because essentially we are approximating our true path of our fictitious particle in parameter space using step sizes which are going to miss some of this posterior curvature. Essentially in the middle we would like to step a very small distance here. So why is it a problem that we get these divergent iterations? It's because we get these divergent iterations whenever sigma t is quite small. In other words, we're in a region of parameter space where sigma t is small. And because we get these divergent iterations only when we're currently sampling a value of sigma t which is small, that means that we get a bias. And we get a bias away from these particular settings. In other words, where sigma t is small. Why is that bias a problem? Well, it's a problem because essentially what that will lead us to conclude is that sigma t is actually larger than it truly is. 
In other words, we will imagine that there is much greater heterogeneity in the individual group means than actually exists in reality. So I've talked about the problems of using non-centered parameterizations. What is the solution? Well, it turns out the solution is to use what are known as non-centered parameterizations. Whilst the details of non-centered parameterizations vary dependent on the particular model that you're using, the framework that I'm introducing now is at least analogous across these different classes of models. I should also say that many classes of models do not, in fact, have non-centered parameterizations. So then you have to seek alternative solutions, for example, using Riemannian Monte Carlo. But considering this example here, where we've got normal data and uh, normally distributed data and normal priors, if I write down the prior again, our prior is that mu1 is normally distributed about some mean, mu t, and some top level standard deviation sigma t. Another way of writing down exactly the same data generating process for our prior is to write mu1 equals mu t plus z1 times sigma t, where z1 is being normally distributed with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And to see that these latter two statements are exactly the same as the above statement, then we really need to think about the properties of a normal distribution. But nonetheless, we can reason that the bottom two statements are equivalent to the top if we just think about the properties of the top and the bottom. If we think about the mean of the bottom, if I was to write the expectation of this whole statement or the left-hand side of this statement, then we'd see that on the right-hand side, if I was to take the expectation, well, mu t is just a constant, so I get mu t. And if I take the expectation of the second term, then I'm going to get zero because z1 is of mean zero and it's being independently drawn from a normal distribution of mean zero. So we get that the mean of mu1 from the latter two statements is mu t, which is the same as the top, which is also mu t. And the same would be true if I was to consider the standard deviation of the bottom two statements. I'd also get sigma t. And it's a property of a normal distribution that if you have a normal distribution and you multiply it by a constant, essentially that leads to multiplying the standard deviation of that normal distribution by the constant. If I then add on a constant to that, then we still have a normal distribution, but it's got a mean at the constant value plus the mean of the original normal. So we see that the latter two statements are identical to the top statement. So why does that help us? To answer this question, I'm first of all going to rewrite down the second two statements. So I've got that mu1 is equal to mu t plus z1 times sigma t. And I'm assuming here that z1 is being normally distributed with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And I should say that even though I've illustrated this for mu1, the same would be true for mu2, except I'd have z2 here, which would also be independently drawn from a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So what we're imagining now is that instead of sampling mu1 and mu t, what we're now sampling is mu t and z1 or z2, etc. Why does that help us? Well, let's draw again our distribution of, our posterior distribution of mu t versus mu1. So again, we have our y equals x line, which looks something like that. And we have that our contours are correlated with the y equals x line and look something like that, which I'm drawing now. Now, if we look at this equation, the top equation here, we see that essentially, this is a y equals mx plus c line, y being mu1 and x here being mu t and m implicitly being 1, except that now we've got a kind of random element to the line. Why does that help us? Well, essentially what we're doing is that to make mu1, then what we do is we take mu t and then we add on a bit of randomness. And the width of that randomness is determined by the product of sigma t, and the standard deviation that we estimate for z1. Remember that this is just a prior distribution that we're assuming here. So 
in the circumstance where we have relatively weak data, essentially Z1 is going to be almost entirely determined by its prior. And so what we have now is that to kind of get mu1, any sample, then essentially what we do is we take mu t and then we add on a kind of random component, which looks something like this sort of red lines, the vertical red lines, which I'm drawing now, or at least they should be vertical. So these red lines kind of represent the typical step sizes that our sampler might want to take in terms of Z1. And importantly, we can see that the step sizes that we would like to use for Z1, which are in this vertical direction, essentially are independent of the value of mu t. We always want to step a kind of similar distance in the vertical direction. Why does that help us? Well, because essentially, if I draw out what the marginal distribution of mu t looks like, it looks something like this. Well, that distribution is simple enough for us to sample from using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. It's just a unimodal distribution and it's not got any of the sharp posterior curvature that we had in the sort of above figure where we're looking at the uh, posterior contours, where if we move in this kind of direction, where we're near the center, we have very sharp curvature. So it doesn't have those properties. And essentially because of the fact that the step sizes that we want to take for Z1 are independent of this step size for mu t, then essentially we can sample from both of these parameters easily using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, and we shouldn't suffer any of the divergent issues that we had before. Another way to think about this is to think about the data generating process itself. Another way of writing this down would be to have xi as being normally distributed with a mean given by mu1, but mu1 we know is given by this right hand side here, so we can write this down as mu t plus z1 times sigma t, and it's also got a standard deviation of sigma one. And we know that Z1 is being assigned a normal prior and also mu t has its own prior. And in the circumstance where we have relatively weak data, essentially mu t is determined solely by its prior and the data. And Z1 is almost entirely determined by its own prior because of the fact that we find that sigma t is very, very small. And, and hence, essentially, that decouples the second part of this expression from our data, its influence on the data. So now, if we draw the posterior contours here, we should find that these two things are essentially uncorrelated with one another. So we get posterior geometries that look something like this. And this is non-pathological. We can use Hamiltonian Monte Carlo to sample from this posterior geometry. So what do the models look like for the centered and the non-centered parameterizations? Essentially, in the centered case, we have a top level parameter here, mu t, which determines a group level parameter, mu1, which in turn determines our data, x. Whereas in the non-centered equivalent, then what we have here is we have a parameter, mu t, and another parameter, which I'm going to call Z, or oh, here's Z1 actually, and those both in turn determine our data X. So in the center parameterization, we see that there is quite a separation between the top level parameter and our data, whereas in the non-centered equivalent, our top level parameter is directly connected with the data. And that helps in weak data settings, because essentially mu t is entirely determined by its priors and the data, and that essentially decouples Z1, which can be solely determined by its own priors. Whereas in the centered parameterization, we have a very indirect effect of mu t on x through mu1, which leads to these sharp posterior curvatures that cause issues with Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. I want to clarify something here. Both the centered and the non-centered parameterizations have exactly the same data generating process. The difference between these two parameterizations is in the parameters that are being actively sampled. In the center parameterization, I directly sample mu t and mu1, whereas in the non-centered parameterization, I sample mu t and z1. 
And due to that difference in the parameters that are actively sampled, that means that in general, the non-centered parameterization, especially for weak models, has a more favorable posterior geometry for Hamiltonian Monte Carlo than for the centered parameterization. I should say, however, that the non-centered parameterization still works for the circumstance where we've got good data, so a lot of data for each of the groups, except that the effects of using a non-centered parameterization are less marked in that circumstance relative to a centered parameterization.